Yeah, come here, Brunei. Come here. Hey, Kevin, how are you? How's it going? Good. Good. Hi, Kevin. Having teenagers is such a such a such a keeps the keeps us on our toes. Not as cold as the last time. Oh, we're putting the winter. Everything good? Oh yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. That's getting to be a, a bad yeah. word yeah. around here. Well, how are you this was a good news. Good. Oh, this, this was with the transportation. Oh, there he was, the one that was put up there. So, how are you settling in? Well, it's been a whirlwind trip, uh, yeah. back and forth. But yeah. uh, things are occurring, uh, I think, in a good way. The committee assignments are finalized. That took a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, getting established in our office, and you know, mm -hmm. back, got to see that. Got to get a few yes. more. We've got to get a few more, uh, yeah. you know, pictures of memorabilia up there. Right. Yeah. Uh, but then we've opened up in the uh, Hyannis office. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, at a new location. One financial place. Yes. Yeah. Or it's, yeah. 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 More accurately, it was at 297 North Street. Right. Yeah. That's what it's right. made for. But that's open. Mm -hmm. We actually have furniture. Good. <laughs> so Lance, thank goodness for the little that. things. Maybe a computer. <laughs> well, the computers uh, uh, are in, but they're being. Uh, you know, connected now right. uh, and synchronized through the Washington office in there. Uh, what happens in the federal government is uh, collective purchasing. Uh, it's just yeah. the, everything that's IT and even our stationery. I can't give you a business card yet because all of that right. is there to save money and so it goes at a snail's pace. And you have the office that was once John Kennedy's office. I do. He was a congressman. That was his congressional office and interesting enough it was uh, uh, Congressman Jeanette Rankin's office, who was the first woman uh, huh? ever elected to Congress, and she was elected before there was national suffrage, because in her state, which I think might have been Wyoming. Montana, uh, Wyoming, Wyoming, it was a Rocky Mountain state, right. uh, they allowed voting for women in 1917 and 16, and uh, so she got elected and, and was a congressperson before there was suffrage. Well, there was that suffrage in New Jersey right after the revolution, but then they woke up and I guess they, they took it away until 1920. Yeah. You know, I, I had said, I had made a passing remark to um, my daughter once about uh, Republicans and women, and I said, you know, it just seems like Republicans really sort of embrace women, you know, almost easily, much more easily than, you know, Democrats for all their talk. And she said, well, you know why that is, because <clears throat> those states, um, it was really the more conservative states that allowed women's rights first because the woman was part of the survival uh, yes, unit. Yes. You know, yeah. you were a prairie, you're out there in the prairie. Exactly. That's a you point. had to uh, shoot as much as, it wasn't just the guy that went yeah. out and hunted and you took care of the children. Everybody shared those jobs. So uh, women had a much more equal status uh, in at that time. So it was much more easy for them to, to ratify that. So I thought that was an interesting... Yeah. So this is a little history of the office. Yes. Okay, well, in Massachusetts, of course, Ab I think Abigail uh, Adams had as much to do with, uh, with some of the policies that John Adams right. uh, brought forth as anybody. So we have a great history of influence of women. And if you look outside the uh, courthouse, you'll yes, see yeah. a statue of Mercy Otis Warren, mm -hmm. who uh, I guess wrote a uh, biography of John Adams, which wasn't too that's Thelma in your office reading the Washington Post. Oh, man. And then we had, of course, uh, Deborah Sampson, who fought that revolution in right. Massachusetts. She was sitting in your chair. She looks too comfortable. I know. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, like she was check. made for the job. Yeah, well, she was. <laughs> I know. She should have run. All right, so we should... Um, well... First of all, yeah. officially, yeah. as the chairman of the Constable County Commission, let me welcome you. Right. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you. And, and I thought that uh, you know uh, we would give you a uh, uh, something to to take away uh, mm -hmm. that would talk about the structure, and this would give you the organization of Constable County. Uh, the uh, this happens to be an older version, so it doesn't reflect the wastewater collaborative, which would probably be the the thing that we would talk to you right. most in terms of the availability of funding. And, and I think Lance. You know, knows about uh, you know about those issues and has shared them with you. And, and remember the photo op down at Dennis. That's right. I, I did drop a, you know a laundry list on you about you know, about things that the yeah. county is concerned about. I, I met last week with the regional head of the EPA, uh, mm -hmm. Kurt Spaulding. Yes. And we discussed the wastewater issue uh, around Cape Cod, which he was fully aware of. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly enough, his background includes working around Narragansett Bay and. and many of the same issues before he had his current job. Mm -hmm. uh, and from your perspective, from the county level, his strongest advice was 
uh, there's no silver bullet, there's no easy way to yeah. deal with it, but we must take advantage of regionalization as much as we can. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, that was his strong well, advice there. But the, uh, the umbrella that we have been attempting to provide, right. you know, is, is you know, still out there. It is our goal to, uh, to make sure that we end up with what I would call a consolidated uh, wastewater management plan that, you know, that helps all of our individual communities with the idea that we would support what individual communities are doing in the hope that they would recognize that we are standing on our water and that, uh, that although towns might have a, uh, a political boundary, they do not have a, a boundary that separates them from the yeah. sharing of the water. Table. And the diversity of the communities, for instance, Chatham, Provincetown, the density is, is such that right. it's more economical exactly. to, to, to treat it. But when you're dealing uh, in the Mid-Cape areas where the houses are spread out and the costs go that much right. higher, so it's going to be difficult. Well, uh, at some point... In any case, we're depending upon your help with this. Well, you will. I mean, that's why I had one of my first meetings I asked to sit down with him. Uh, and we're going to work with our state delegation as well and with you and, and all our communities. It's just at the outset, his advice was uh, just work at preparing what you're already doing and getting ready so that when opportunities come, you can spring into action. Exactly. Um, at some point, I think that, um, you know, Lance is very familiar with, um, you know, the Wastewater Collaborative Director Andy and um, Paul Nitzwicki at the Commission, and it would be worthwhile just to talk to, the, to them as far as where we're at. But is it, in, we're not going to belabor all these issues, but um, the towns, the, the, the citizens seem to embrace a regional approach much uh, more readily than boards of selectmen. And the other thing to uh, be aware of is that DEP puts the onus on the towns. Like they have to take a look at their comprehensive wastewater management plan and they have to have it approved and that sort of thing. So it, it feels like the weight is on every individual town, whereas it does make more sense. We can, it's going to be a $3 billion project no matter what. We go from a regional standpoint, but if every town does it, it could go right. to eight billion dollars. So it does have a economic impact to have, to look at where these dense areas are you know, to reduce to where we are complying. We don't have to sewer all the Cape, and we don't want to have to wait for a court order to yeah. say we're going to sewer been, everything. They've been sued by the Conservation right. Law Foundation, well, yeah. or at least they're we're there, in there, we're yeah, that's, that's an interesting, an interesting question. We're very concerned about the fact that you know that's out there. And there's the uncertainty that comes from it being out there and not being executed. Well, you don't want to uh, be in a position that occurred in the rest of the state right. uh, with the Mass Water Resource Authority because once the courts get involved, uh, they don't care about the money the way they should. Right. They'll, they'll go to the Rolls-Royce approach and say, this is how are you going to do it? I used to always use the analogy when the courts got involved in the wastewater problem around Boston Harbor that uh, it's just like you were putting repairs on your home. Now, you can have those repairs and budget for them and do it in stages, and you can get bids and say, you know, you have six months to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you have to go to that same contractor and say, uh, I want to bid on this, and it has to be done by next Wednesday, mm -hmm. you probably get someone to bid on it if you give them enough money. Right. Uh, and that's what happens when it gets in the hands of the court. Cause, so that is not the way to go. And, and no. we, for several mm -hmm. years, have been trying to avoid that. Right. Okay, and, and hopefully... You know, that, that because the cost will go up dramatically at the courts because they, the, the suit's based on mm -hmm. uh, environmental issues and not uh, enough, mm -hmm. at least that history in Massachusetts, on what the costs are. Right. Yeah. Now, segue into another question that I think you're very concerned with because I was pleased to see you join the Small Business Committee. I, I didn't, yeah, I was appointed to it. Appointed to it, okay. Well, I wish you could just join the committee. Yeah, well, I, I, so do I because, you know. But I was pleased with that because yeah. it will give me an opportunity to just be sort of at the vanguard of what's happening and what they're doing to help businesses because around the country. 70, what, what, what our workforce board is telling us, and uh, I recently uh, asked uh, Sheila to uh, replace me on the uh, on our local uh, you know, Cape and Islands Workforce Investment Board, is that uh, they've identified at least 7,000 jobs that are not filled. And I think I, I dropped this, I mentioned this to you, that we need uh, to qualify people to develop their skills, and that seems to be an opportunity let's say, to create what I would call something very close to my heart, which is how do we, in, uh, using a, uh, a, 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 a principle of social justice to create livable wage income opportunities, livable wage jobs. And many of these jobs that are going unfilled 
fit that category, but they, we need to provide some avenue of training in order to qualify people for it. Yeah. And I'm hoping that your work you know, over there you know, would help move this along. Well, nationwide, 60% of the new jobs are being projected as coming from small businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's probably more here mm -hmm. because the small businesses are the uh, backbone. And right. we are looking, but, too, at the implementation of Open Cape. Because yes. that broadband is going to really uh, open up so many opportunities for not only the businesses that are here to be able to expand and to grow, but also for new businesses to come. Right. And we had Dan Gallagher, we talked this morning about, uh, Dan comes in periodically, he's the president of Open Cape, um, to talk with us about the impact in terms of job creation of where Open Cape will have for, uh, for the Cape, so that we can begin to look at, it, as Bill said, providing the skills that people will need to be able to uh, acquire jobs. Yeah, we want to make sure that when people are looking for the financing, that it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the oversights of this committee is on small business administration, we'll try and see if we can be helpful right. there. Uh, and it's, there's, a, there's an overlap of different jurisdictions with the committee, but the one thing is that the new ideas and the concerns, for instance, is part of it is on renewable energy. Uh, right. Uh, the other focus is even, and I don't know where it would fit in, but they even this committee's had experience dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers. Oh, mm -hmm. good. Well, certainly, the, talking about the bridges then. Well, the dredging issue down here yeah. is a, a huge issue, mm -hmm. and one of the concerns, not only myself, but a lot of the coastal uh, congressmen, is the earmarking issue mm -hmm. uh, and the difficulty in getting earmarks now, because right. uh, that's, that's the type of project that earmarks are important for, right. because when people are doing the overall budget, you know, they're not doing it with the coastal communities. Well, yeah, and they're, they're, looking for bad, they're looking for predictability in the, you know, in the, in the process. Uh, you know, you've had experience on you know, the short cycle nature of public funding, and you, know, you go into panic every year because oh. of it. Because well, of Chatham is, is huge, yeah, and even the, the work that's done in the canal. Mm -hmm. I even had some dredging near my house uh, in the last year and a half or so, on uh, Little Bay. You're living in Great Gable? Right. Uh, little Bay, they, they were doing some work there. Uh, and well, that's the county the has... You know, the bridges are you know, another issue that, oh, yeah. uh, that uh, we're trying to get the attention of uh, the Corps of Engineers in Washington. Locally, you know, they're very friendly and everything, but they really don't have any, uh, what I'd call, authority to give us some direction on when those seven, six-year-old bridges will be either replaced or improve our way yeah, to take care of the I read in the Cape Cod Times there was an article that dealt with the fact that there are some people are predicting a 10 year okay. you know lifespan before mm -hmm. there's going to be major and I must admit too you go over it every time and you see 1933 right, and, yeah. and, and the thought crosses your mind okay. they're, okay, well, they're still here we have, well, the MPO that is the conduit of funds for transportation here in okay. the Cape is supported by the consolidated uh, joint uh, committee on transportation and we've been putting this forward for a couple of years now. And that is you know, something that we, we want your support on uh, making sure that we at least have a planning process in place oh. that, you know, that, that, you know, that looks at yeah. when these things you know, might happen. And that the planning has to be uh, done well in advance and well planned because you, you take out one of those bridges at a time. Because what's being forecast is not minor repair to those bridges, but major repair. Right. Exactly. And, and if, if you're losing one of your bridges, the effect of that on tourism <coughs> or commerce, it would be enormous. And there's also discussion of a third bridge, because I the know. bridges that we have are not really <coughs> adequate to, you know, for the flow of traffic. Or even a tunnel. Um, can yeah, I, I've seen those. Uh, if, if I could just go back to economic development for a second, you know, there is the SEDS, the SEDS uh, document that the federal government, uh, comprehensive economic development strategy that they asked for, oh, for from regions, you know, from the local RPAs and whatever projects in that region uh, get on that that uh, document are then sort of earmarked and you know, brought to the notice of uh, those in Washington and beyond. And uh, a couple of years ago, the commission took care of that, but they did it in a, in a very comprehensive way. They invited a lot of workshops a lot of business people across um, like the Cape from the arts to uh, small business to you know the different sectors and uh, came up with a SEDS document that <clears throat> was actually hailed by the federal government and said this is really the way these documents should go. So there were projects that are in there. Um, one was Open Cape and we were successfully were able to get that money but now we're moving that dollars. forward. The other one is, I mean, we're looking at different projects here on the Cape. So that is a document that you should um, 
be aware of, and again, that's through the commission. So that would be a good stopover um, at some point to kind of get the lay of the land on uh, on that. I'd be issue. happy to send you a copy of that. Yeah, and um, you know what our priorities, what we're looking at, and we're going to there's going to be an update on that. In and April. the second piece of that with the SEDS is that IBM is very interested in what the Cape is doing in terms of the broadband initiative, as well as in terms of water quality, and. Uh, the Cape Cod Commission has been working with IBM and the, and the Economic Development Council to look at a, a, a regional strategy um, or a center for <coughs> excellence, center of excellence, excellence, water excellence, where a, a strategic information office could be created that would, and IBM would help to build a platform for really? that along with Open Cape, yeah. so that all of, the, all of the data on water for all of the water bodies and the estuaries on the Cape would all be stored in that, in that one database. So that every town, ta every town would put their information there, but everybody could have access to it. So we would. This is a big thing with IBM. They have been doing this all over the world, in Korea, China, Africa, everywhere. They have been involved in building um, or contributing to build data centers for for water quality. So they're very interested, and it's. Uh, have a name for it. It's called Smart Cape Cod. Yes. And if we're successful in getting the funding, I think it's about we've applied for 435 or 450 thousand dollar grant from IBM to get this up and running. Well, so this is having a, you know having a sole source aquifer makes it more critical. Right. Uh, to do that, so I think that would help. That's a strong right. point. Yeah. If this I could be helpful great. in that effort with IBM, that issue alone is right. is critical because there's no other area probably, at least in our country, where there's such an expansive uh, developed land, where there's only a sort of one sort of, you know, aquifer servicing it all, and, and the, the, you know, the danger of that being contaminated is just so great that, you know, that would put us, I think, in a unique position. And what makes the Cape unique, even to in comparison to the state, you know, the state is looking at um, uh, wastewater um, uh, refinancing to a lot of the areas to upgrade their systems. We don't even have the infrastructure yet. So that's what makes us different when it comes to looking at funding. We don't even have the infrastructure in place. So that's why our price tag is way up. And uh, we're looking at it from scratch, not like a city that's you, you in place. You recall when the upgrading. MWRA was beginning, they already had infrastructure. In right. Of so they were just improving. So, you know, starting, <coughs> so I starting from challenging. the beginning, you know, is, it, you know, is an issue. I hope that's the last time any of us have to reference uh, Comparison with the MWRA. Yeah. There's me a lot right here because of the expense yeah. of that. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. what we're. That's that's right. Fear here. There's a, there's another area too that's of great interest to us, and that's the MMR. You remember yeah. a few years back they were on the closing list, the BRAC list. I met with them uh, last week before oh, I went did? to Washington. Yeah. I know that Bill Dalhan has been very involved in trying to um, support the base in this homeland security. Um, yeah. Endeavors, uh, you know, to build. That's one of my committees too. I know, so, so I thought helpful. this is great because we again. we sure don't want to lose. Uh, no, and it's on. getting difficult now because I, I think there's a, a focus on defense cuts, right? And there'll be a focus again on you know, on, you know the BRAC approach, and we were in danger before, but uh, you know I think it, you know there's a lot going on. One of the things uh, with them getting uh, self-reliant on their own electricity, anything. Do to comparatively keep the cost down it helps you with the brand. Bill Delahunt was emphasizing the point of making this a, uh, a sort of a coordinated training center, mm -hmm. and that's that's there. I mean, yeah. right. it's and so the idea it's of transferring yeah. from a let's say from an active duty station to one that would be centered on homeland security. They've simulated mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the training. Mm -hmm. Now I, I believe going that, on in Afghanistan, Lance told me that, uh, that's that one of your aides, I think Stephanie Cox, was going to visit with our regional emergency planning committee. To see how we had set that up, uh, the ICS program was one. Uh, we were one of the first areas that, you know, that uh, uh, became qualified to uh, to do the ICS training. I, I had the opportunity to go to you know, to Aniston to do that. Not from the point of view of becoming you know, a, a commander, but more from the point of view of understanding <coughs> how the process worked to be able to stand out of the way for people to you know, for delivering the service. No, and I think there's potential for. You know, drones and other technological advances that can be used there. And you know, there's that cantonment, <coughs> that, you call it, that, that on the lower part of the base, yeah. where there was going to be an opportunity for some kind of business development uh, that might be related. It could be related to Open Cape, it could be related to. Um, Who's the thought with Open Cape? That could be a great. <coughs> 
uh, match. Mm -hmm. Even in, in renewable energy, there was some discussion energy, yeah. about algae to energy mm -hmm. and yeah. some of those. That unfortunately yes, that. has reached uh, some sort of a glitch because yeah, the, uh, the licensing uh, agencies of the state are not as optimistic as you know, let's see, as, as some of the developers have been involved, and I believe that that might reside as an opportunity at the federal level in order to move this whole process forward. Uh, are you involved in any renewable energy? Uh, yeah, I'm joined uh, the Renewable Energy no, Caucus. Okay. There's the Caucus of Congressional People, and that they're very interested because of Cape Wind okay. uh, as well in terms of getting the uh, we've had more the influence of solar by the way. And solar, any kind of renewable energy, in terms but, of, in terms of public but it's it's actually a very active caucus. A lot of the caucuses uh, aren't that active. You just join and you remember. But this particular caucus is. Uh, I was asked to uh, to join that, so I think that would be helpful. Uh, there's one one topic of, that's close to my heart, and that is uh, CDBG. Uh, the, there are three entitlement communities on the Cape, and the other 12 communities on the, on the Cape don't have access directly to, you know, to that money. And uh, I, I fought for this uh, you know, at the National Association of County Officials, and we, you know, I've noticed it's got renewed every year, but it still doesn't give us direct access to it. And I see that Beth Albert, who's the head of our Human Service Department, is here, and uh, that is one way that we could, you know, we could provide an umbrella for the other 15 towns. Segwaying from that, you know, when you're talking about renewable energy, we have uh, solicited an opportunity from the state to provide that same umbrella for green communities because individually there are a lot of communities within 351 in the Commonwealth that do not qualify on their own to be eligible for the green community uh, criteria, but joining together with a couple of other towns regions could, and we could do that here, and we have presented arguments uh, for, uh, on, the, on, on behalf of the Cape Line Compact to support that, and we think that with, that's a, with the combination of the CBBG and the, uh, and the Green Communities Consolidation because we did get and did qualify for a, a energy efficiency development block, block grant for restoring, I say, for, uh, for fixing up historical structures. We've, we've shown that we do have the capacity and the structure in order to, to you know, let's say, to deliver that service, but we would need your help you know, on that. So we're, we're looking forward to that. That could be one of the areas where uh, you know, where they're cutting back funds. This could be one of the areas where there's still funding available. Certainly the President, uh, in the State of the Union speech, uh, made uh, that a priority and as an area of growth, as well as uh, different transportation issues as well. Uh, the transportation bond is due up this year. Safety rule funding when you And hopefully that will get passed. I don't know, earmarking and that's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but there are, there are unique issues here, and I've been in touch with Tom Kerr quite a bit right. uh, on these issues. You know, uh, the idea of mobility for seniors is, remains a very important issue here because you don't have public transportation and, and having the ability with bus and transport and with, you know, the taxi cab, the things that he's been able to do here. And we're rural. That's, we're looking that's at what I'm saying. Rural. Yeah, especially the Outer Cape is really rural. You know, we're very... Uh, yeah, the uh, flex route, which is, you know, which is an innovative service that we provide on the whole Cape uh, is unique, you know, in the Commonwealth, but it's not self it's not self sustainable. It does need you know, it does need continued support yeah. and, uh, and we're you know we're trying to maintain And those issues that, that transcend everything else. I mean uh, health care services and everything else. You need that mobility uh, to, to continue. Yes, you right. know, so we're we have a lot of frail elders there. We have been in contact a lot. And our census numbers sir going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, well, the sense. census numbers overall, but then the census of seniors. That's what it is. Yes. Exactly. I mean, yeah. there's, there's a rise okay. there, yes. not an overall rise there. So right. you have a separation that's occurring. Right. Uh, we were talking about the, you know, our concern about frail elders here in the Cape, and the, you know, the concern about the, you know, mobility support, as well as, as well as access to services, and the need to have some type of continuing evaluation to support their needs because uh, I believe the figures we use are 24% of us are over 65 and 30, I'll say 34% I guess are over 55. So there's that window of people that are getting there and there's a window of people that are beyond that. So you know, that's a great concern. It's also, also part of what I personally believe is the responsibility the government has to support a safety net for those legitimate issues for people who cannot uh, 
advocate for themselves to, you know, to get the services that they need. So we're depending upon you know, your, your yeah, interest yeah. in this, which brings up a question I, I, I've been wanting to ask them. You know, one of the questions that I uh, have for people in public public services, you know, what are the issues? Or what is the you know, the thing that you know, means the most to you? You know, where's your heart in, in all of this? Because we, in knowing that, you know, we could perhaps be able well, to I frame our reference. And, you know, yeah, the reason I've done what I've done for years uh, is uh, a very strong feeling that would make this country different than other countries, and. and that's another, the third committee of honors, the Committee on Foreign Affairs. It's interesting, despite all the negative things you hear about our country, we're still number one uh, economically. And you, know, you would think that we're trailing the way you listen to people. Uh, and you'll think we're the only ones with problems. Uh, the country that's breathing down our back, China, has uh, such, a, I think, terrible, terrible uh, social problems it's going to have to deal with. Not to uh, mention problems with the environment. Oh, Oh, they just yeah. yeah, they just dump things. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But our country is forged on opportunity. So an answer, I'm giving you a very fundamental answer, uh, which a lot of people I think should always reflect upon why they're doing what they're doing. Now, when I was a DA and I had a title and I was active, people knew what my mission was: <coughs> to keep them safe. Uh, people, if they see a clergy member, they know what their mission is. Uh, but you know, in, in, today in Congress, when you see Congress, congressmen, people will question, what is that mission? So right. that's a great question. And, and to me, uh, it's to safeguard that opportunity. The reason we're different as a, a, a country is we are truly a land of opportunity. Not equal opportunity, we'd like to have that, but mm -hmm. opportunity. And that separates us from so many other countries. And I was looking at the State of the Union speech the other night, and I was reflecting on the fact that uh, it, it wasn't directly stated in that speech, but the idea that we are the land of innovation, exactly. uh, that we are the land of uh, allowing people to express themselves and create, that's what's made us different. So what I want to do, and it reflects on every other issue, is do everything I can to keep uh, what made this country different alive, and right now, we're in more difficulty with that than I think in a lot of other times. There have been other times, there have been the, certainly the Civil War, the Depression, other issues, but yeah. right now uh, we have to keep opportunity alive, and that means we have to support education, uh, because if, if we don't have people that are trained and educated, uh, we don't have a good democracy and we don't have a good economy. Uh, that also means we have to uh, allow the ability of businesses to innovate and not strangle them. Uh, and it also means that uh, we have to be the kind of society that uh, can act upon that opportunity and, and, and have a system to flourish. So uh, with the great economic uh, crisis we've had over the last couple of years, I think uh, reflected even more on the fact that we have to safeguard that opportunity. It's a, not our, our personal freedoms, but our education. And, and, that, and if we don't have that, uh, our economy's not going to flourish as well. So we're... Uh, that's a very fundamental question, but that's that's what makes me tick, is well, the fact that I, I feel... You just uh, stated the Admiral uh, was it, uh, uh, Stockdale's you know, paradox, that we can't lose sight of the fact that we're in very critical times, but we have to engender hope. Right. There's no reason not to be hopeful. That's well, why we are our own worst <laughs> critics. Mm -hmm. All right. Going back to uh, going back to your time as a DA, I know one of the issues that was really important to you was the whole issue of substance oh, yeah. And FAN, you know, the uh, Freedom from Abuse, uh, Kate McHugh, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're putting together a forum on heroin and oxycontin use, and also they're, they're looking further about the pharmacy reporting and all that. And she asked me specifically if I would mention to you that... No, no, uh, I mean, we've been attending the meetings awesome. even before I was right, sworn right. into office right. uh, because of this. I think we can bring something to it. Another caucus, uh, uh, Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Mary Bono Mack, who was Sonny Bono's wife. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. And she succeeded him. Right. Uh, and uh, Massachusetts Congressman Lynch, they, they started uh, a caucus on, uh, and, and again, they asked me to get involved in that, given my DA experience. There you go. I mean, that's very very that. I mean, that's yeah. a, a, so it's a, a huge. Well, we huge. Were in, I was in Cape Cod Hospital right. this morning, mm -hmm. and in the course of the discussions, I was asking, because 
uh, I didn't realize the emergency room at Cape Cod Hospital is the second busiest mm -hmm. in the country. That's right. okay. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and it's the second busy. And I was asking how many people come in because of self medication issues or abuse. And uh, I was told quite a few. Yes. The elbows. Yes. The highest and percentage. Really and if you talk to a in dentist ER. or you talk to anyone else, uh, a, a physician, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you see the symptoms. People think that everyone that's involved in this ends up in front of the criminal justice system. And it, they don't, because the numbers we use were public health numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really 1.7 people overdosing and dying a day mm -hmm. on opiate, opiate overdoses in Massachusetts alone. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a frightening mm -hmm. number. You Norfolk know, County years ago had a wonderful program of pretrial probation for kids that were, you know, were picked up for substance abuse. I think most of the yeah, we, offices we have that, that now. Yeah. But the uh, most visits in the ER. Or drug one way through, one way or another, and mm -hmm. and that's not you know maybe it's a little higher, but it's it's a problem all over the country. So uh, we have to do uh, an awful lot more. What I I'm a firm believer in, uh, and I was able to do it through my office uh, when I had it before is middle school education. Just you know, and it sounds soft. It's the most effective thing you can do. Mm -hmm. It I still was, is. I was at fifth grade uh, the other day, and they were showing a, a unit on it marijuana use, which I thought was very appropriate because you can't start too soon mm -hmm. in telling people about you know, what, you know, what they need to do, kids what they need to do, and, and gave them some strategies. Of course, it reminded me of what the nuns used to tell us about you know, standing up for yourself. But they, you know, we're trying to instill that. Uh, well, I was in a Noah shop, I'll never forget. You know, you hear stories. There's a gentleman there that shared his story. And, uh, Within the last couple of years, he was making $180,000 a year on Newbury Street I know that guy. in Boston. Yeah, that's right, yeah. uh, you know, and, and making a fortune in his business. Okay. And he had back surgery, and, and they treated him with pain with OxyContin, and he got addicted. Mm -hmm. That's where he is. Right. So, I mean, uh, prescription drug medication, it's important at every level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's a whole senior population. Oh, yeah. Uh, because they're more prone to... Uh, having, you know, physical challenges, mm -hmm. where that becomes a problem, too. So you just, it, it's not just kids, it's, it's all of us have to really be aware of that. Uh, and and they were, you know, I know I'll get people angry at me, but it's true. I mean, dentists that were prescribing it for dental work right. with kids. Right. And what kind of message and what kind of reality is that? And, and there's no question that uh, OxyContin is the gateway to uh, you know, heroin because it's the only other thing that can match it in terms of its potency, and it's cheaper. Well, and once that happens... Uh, I, 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 you're probably hearing more about methamphetamines, you know... Uh, you know Not as much in this area. No, I'm talking about... You know, National, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, okay. drifting okay. away. I, 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 I wanted to just ask one, one thing, and it's off the topic here, because I'm sure everywhere you go, people are saying, well, this is what... The situation is, and this is what we need. We need you to bring us buckets of money and, and you know, SWAT. So, as a matter of fact, that is I, I, I'm sure it is. So I, I just wanted to take three minutes. I know that you now attended your first um, State of the Union address. Yes. And, um, you know, there was uh, all of that dating that went on there yes. as far as... Um, so how do you how do you feel? Do you think that there is going to be more of a bipartisan um, effort in, in moving things forward, or was or do you feel that they're all going to go back into their camps and uh, take their I think take there's ideological going to be, stance? There's going to be ideological splits, uh, yeah. and uh, you know if you go back historically, there always has been, right. and they've been pretty major. Right. right, but people were able to put sometimes their ideology behind yeah. and and come to this is the problem yeah. and this is the best. And what's interesting is uh, I didn't have a I went on a blind date for that night. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have a pre-planned uh, meeting right. with someone. I just figured I would go there, and, uh, and I ended up sitting next to... I said I wanted to sit next to the Arizona delegation. I wanted to sit with the Arizona delegation because uh, I ended up sitting diagonally in front of mm -hmm. uh, Congressman Gifford's empty seat mm -hmm. uh, and sort of give them some support during a pretty tough time. Right. And I sat next to another freshman, Dave Schweikert, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, in that mm -hmm. area. And, you know, he's a, he's a real private sector guy, multimillionaire uh, by reputation. Mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, he doesn't, he's a numbers guy that puts together businesses right. and does the venture capital. Very smart guy. And we were sitting during the speech next to each other. 
And I was asking him, you know, because much of what the president said was recycled. Mm -hmm. I don't mean it in the bad sense. No, I, I mean that these aren't the all new ideas. Words, right. um, and, and if you close your eyes and listen to many of the things he said, or most of the things he said, that would, could be a Republican president uttering those same Absolutely. words. I mean, let's, oh, look at oh, deregula let's look at deregulation and get serious about it and, and you know, stop uh, you know, unnecessary regulation that interferes with business. Let's look at innovation and fund that. Let's prioritize. Let's put a five-year cap on dis discretionary spending. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, look at those themes. Uh, and and it also he said about corporate tax reform, mm -hmm. or get rid of the loopholes, but then lower well, the corporate well, tax overall, right. which will help businesses, and do the same thing with people's personal. And so a few times during the speech, uh, I leaned to him and I said, you know, we've heard these things before. Do you really think it can happen? And he said, you know what, I think under these circumstances, yes, I think a lot of this can happen. And so I think that what he said was different, but the times are different. Exactly. And, and I do think out of necessity, getting a hold of our, curtailing our spending overall, um, dealing with issues uh, that will help the economy directly, looking at regulations that free up business. And, you know, and if we ever could, I mean, the thing that, I used to be taxation chair in the, in the Senate years ago. It's nice to say, let's get rid of the loopholes and lower the overall tax. That's so hard to do, because they're there for a reason, and all the right. lobbyists that deal with it. But uh, I do think there's an opportunity to do some significant, uh, you know, coalitions uh, mm -hmm. across parties. I do think there'll be a divide, too. But, you know, the divide can be healthy, as long as it's not, uh, it doesn't go to the point that nothing gets done. Right. Well, uh, uh, I just fear... People need to use Kenzie, too. Kenzie and the economics I, back in the middle of the plane. Uh, it's needed right now. And I think Krugman is on the right track. I, I just fear that, uh, you know, people have, you know, forget what the role of government is and that it has a significant role and it doesn't mean that we're... Government does things regulate. that people can't, can't do for themselves. That's exactly right. And exactly. we are there for, to try to equalize the playing field. We can't, we can't make it equal, but yeah. to try to put some equity And there's things it. government can't do, or if right. they try to do, they get in the way. That's right. So, so I, I do think that there's that opportunity there. Uh, I'm the eternal optimist anyways. Okay. But... Uh, I do think so, and, that yeah, was, and I do think that there's that opportunity, yeah. because the times dictate it. Yeah. And, and uh, remember in the State of the Union speech, one of the lines he emphasized was the fact that, uh, going back to John Kennedy, or maybe, uh, actually, I did that in my maiden speech on John Kennedy. Oh. So if we don't do things together, right. then they won't get done. Yeah, they won't get done, exactly. Uh, and, and I do think that that era was there, is looking back with the... 50th anniversary of the inauguration. What a great ceremony that was. Mm -hmm. But I look back at a lot of what he had to say, and what he had to say back then has more relevance now. Absolutely. The, the call to civility, mm -hmm. the call to be bipartisan, and, and the call to be hopeful. Right. Well, the hopeful part was, uh, I, I can remember listening, because I, we I was in the service. I was living, I was living uh, working at every improvement room. And I protect myself because I could have gone out of Washington you know, to, to be there. But I remember watching it, and I remember when those words you came out. You, know, the, <laughs> you were actually over there. I was there, though. The, the, you know, about the ask not what your country can do for you, and you were in front of green soup. And, you know, and, and I believe, I really right, believe. Right, we all did. We all did. That's why a lot of us yeah. got and, involved. And, in yeah. and of course, I also remember that when Jack Kennedy was my congressman mm -hmm. in Cambridge, that uh, when I wrote to him, he actually wrote back to me. Well, I hope you kept the letter. Yeah. But you know, one of the first things we'll do, I mean, just from the small business perspective, the first bill I co-sponsored myself was to do away with the 1099 uh, requirements that are under the health care mm -hmm. oh, bill. Oh, yes. yes. And, and I think that, you know, that's an example of, of a well-intended provision of exactly. that bill that's just so burdensome on business that right. we'll do away so with it. So to be what's going to happen with the health care bill? All right, we're going to sit here and talk about that. I'll be back. Okay, we'll see you in the assembly. We have a list of unintended consequences. Yes. Oh, all right. Yeah, they're waiting for you over there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad he's working for you because the last time he ran against me. Thank you. Good to see you. And you'll have to have my watch room. Yeah, we'll have to have my watch room. Yeah, I will. And then we'll, um, I'm going to be down with my daughter, so I'll have to get a tour of the White House. Let's get a report on that. Thank you. All right.